This is the first in a series of lunchtime seminars from the CE Hub covering a variety of topics on circular economy. Um, this, web this webinar today focuses on the right to repair. We have five speakers covering the areas of right to repair and what it means for circular economy, the practicalities of repair from a design and technology perspective, consumer acceptance of alternative consumption models, including repair, and the challenges and opportunities from a, a legis legislative and product safety perspective. But what does right to repair really mean? Keeping products and materials in use for longer is a key part of the circular economy. Being able to replace and repair components within products is just one way of doing this. But many products we use every day, like mobile phones, laptops, fridges, washing machines, and so on, are not designed to, to be repaired. So in this seminar, we'll be exploring the practicalities of designing for repair, citizen engagement in repair, and the challenges and opportunities for repair associated with, with product safety and legislation. Um, I'm Lorraine Whitmarsh. I'm a professor of environmental psychology at the University of Bath. I'm also the director of the ESRC Centre on Climate Change and Social Transformations, or CAST. What our research centre does is really look at the role that people play in tackling climate change, particularly mitigating climate change. And one of our priority areas is material consumption. So we're really interested in this um, area of circular economy and particularly the role that citizens and consumers can play in that shift. Um, I'm really pleased to be joined by a fantastic panel of speakers today. Um, we, have, uh, we have five speakers, each of whom will be speaking for around five minutes uh, before we go into Q&A. So first up, we have Professor Mark uh, Miodovnik, I knew I'd get that wrong, sorry, um, and uh, his colleague, Danielle Perkis. Uh, they are based at UCL. Mark is a professor of materials and society, and they will be talking about the big repair project and how increasing repairability uh, or sort of yeah, how I think the, the, the focus of that project is around um, increasing repairability and the role that citizens um, can play in that uh, shift. Um, next up, we have Janetta Moranko, who is an Im impact fellow um, at the University of Exeter based in the CE Hub. Um, and she specializes in design and engineering and human behavior in relation to the circular economy. Um, we also have Stephen James, who is lead engineer uh, at Bayes in their product uh, office for product safety and standards, OPSS. Um, so we're getting a, a sort of more policy legislative um, perspective from him. And finally, we're joined virtually via a pre-recorded video by Kyle Weens, who is the founder of iFixit, uh, the free repair manual. And so we'll be hearing uh, from him in terms of a more, more sort of practitioner perspective. So a range of kind of academic policy practitioner perspectives uh, today. Um, so I think without further ado, I will now hand over to Mark and Danielle for our first presentation, please. Thank you, Lorraine, and thanks for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, so we, I'm Mark Miodovnik, and this is Danielle Perkis. Um, we're working with um, other researchers at UCL, Seanette Chow and Patrick, uh, Christian Patrick, and um, we uh, together are looking at um, designing for repair and the right to repair um, and, and in particular, the role of citizens in that. And so we want to talk to you about our project, which is called the Big Repair Project. Next slide, please. Um, just a sort of recap for those out there who haven't uh, thought about a circular economy uh, in a sort of schematic way. Um, so in the past, um, stuff is made uh, and you know, your toaster, your, your kettle, your phone, and then in general, um, they get used and break and sort of end up in, in a waste dump. And a small amount of it traditionally has been recycled, but very little. And in fact, the, the electronic waste uh, and other wastes from our households have been going up and up and up and are getting to huge proportions. To hit net zero targets and to reduce the pollution from all this, um, while, while keeping people's quality of life and, and what they're used to, having washing machines, phones, and so on, um, 
we need to move to a circular economy. So we need to keep those goods in circulation for longer. So instead of a toaster lasting three or four years, it's got to last 10, 15 years. A phone similarly, a laptop similarly. And how do we do that? Well, the most efficient way to do that is to make them last longer and to make them last longer in the home and in the user's hands is to be repairable. And that needs to be actually repairable in terms of its technical, but also economically repairable. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, next slide, please. So we're moving to a situation where uh, the word consumer will probably not be an accurate description of your role in society, hopefully not an accurate. So the idea that you're a consumer, your role is to consume stuff and then it becomes waste and you don't have to worry about it, that, that is about to end. Um, and, and your role is to take this wonderful stuff, this amazing phone, this amazing kettle, and to, you're the guardian of it now. It does things for you <laughs> and you look after it and you try and keep it as long as possible. And that's also the goal of the manufacturer. So how do we get to that point? Next slide, please. Uh, well, we get to that point by, by both some legislation because the ground rules for all companies competing will have to be the same and design for obsolescence in the 20th century which is the design for things to break and not to be uh, and not to last too long has been a a, a design <laughs> intention from many companies for many times and actually citizens have put up with it and in fact like it in some respects because it means that there's always an excuse to buy something new and to be a bit cooler and there's been a, a legitimate requirement by business to say that Things are always innovating, so you don't want things to last too long because then you, you won't get the innovation. But if we're to move to things lasting much longer, actually there needs to be, innovation needs to be recouched as the innovation to be sustainable and the innovation to be repairable. And that is where right to repair laws are coming in. And they're being passed all over the place, the EU, the UK, America is bringing in some, um, and this, is going, this, this looks to be a kind of... Uh, um, a trend that is going to continue in order to allow companies to compete on a level playing field, but also to protect citizens um, and the environment, right? So we have to, as a, as a society, have a set of laws that is the rules by which you can sell things. And repairability is now coming right up that agenda. Uh, next slide, please. Um, how, do you, how do you also encourage repairability and what do these laws look like? Well, I mean, in France, there is uh, a law that's been passed so that products like washing machines and phones and, um, and fridges have to have a repairability index. So at the point of sale, the companies are competing not just on price um, and in reputation, but they actually have to have some data which they can show you about the repairability of this object. And repairability indices, as they're called, um, are, are, are a way in which you can have a leveling, leveling playing field, but also that, the, the, that the, um, the citizen can choose, choose to have products that are more repairable. And one of the things that we're trying to do in our project is work out what a repairability index should look like in the UK. Next slide, please. Um, companies that kind of drag their heel <laughs> um, look like they're gonna be forced anyway to do it, not just by legislation, but by people uh, active active shareholders forcing companies to that and you've seen that with them um, in in the oil industry and it's likely to see that more and we, well we have seen active shareholder interest in microsoft and in apple forcing those companies to move their position on repairability and they have been doing so over the last year next slide please we held a right to repair round table with many industry partners of big companies and small companies and with citizens uh, um, represented too and um, at the Royal Academy last year. And the results of, of that discussion, I'm just gonna just, just touch on very briefly. Next slide. And, that, and you can see all these on our website. But basically the repairability index was agreed to as a good measure by all around the table. So this looks to be a very good way forward for the UK. Um, there were concerns by industry about repairability and its effect on safety and liability. Um, the fact, the effect of VAT on repair um, and the idea that innovation and right to repair 
are not necessarily in opposition to each other, but innovation and right to repair can go hand in hand. Next slide, please. So we have some suggested next steps for the research we're going to take, uh, undertake, which we, we're happy to discuss. I'm not going to actually, I'm running out of time, so <laughs> I'm not going to um, dwell on these. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Danielle, because one of the things we wanted to do, and Danielle has been doing, is, is get citizen data on repairability of objects and people's attitudes. So over to Danielle. Okay, I'll try and be quick and rattle through. Um, so um, the big repair project, is a citizen science project we launched in January. Um, but really the background is um, we're looking at the, the, the problems with the current UK right to repair law, which came out last year. So some of the main highlight like, problems of, of that piece of legislation is currently it doesn't prevent um, uh, bundling or put any caps on pricing. So pricing and affordability of repair is still an issue. Um, that legislation doesn't cover all, all of our appliances, it actually doesn't cover things like smartphones or laptops, which obviously are a big part of our um, electronics use day to day. Um, and also it doesn't support citizens, i.e. householders, in terms of access to repair um, and spare parts. It's actually written to support more professional repairers and manufacturers. So this is why the Big Repair Project is about trying to get more kind of data about householders individually, how they feel about the point that something breaks, what do they, what do, they do, what do they face, the choice of um, getting professional repairers or repairing something themselves. Um, oh, next slide, please. Um, so this is broadly the categories we look, we're looking at in terms of appliances. It's things like your fridge, your washing machine, or it's, to, it's toasters and kettles or it's your personal electronics like phones and laptops. Um, next slide. Um, and so this is an example of just one, one piece of data that we're gathering. So we're asking participants about what they expect the lifespan of different appliances to be. And so we can see broadly, most of our responses for the large appliance categories, so washing machines, people expect them to last about 10 years. There are quite a lot of people who also expect them to last longer than that, so around 15 years. Um, for things like kettles and toasters, um, again, uh, most, most people want them to last around 10 years or longer. Um, and then in terms of your small smaller electronics, so your phones and your laptops, people expect them to last sort of at least five years, um, if not longer, which currently if you look at the actual lifespan of most products in these categories now, people expect them to last longer than they actually do at the moment. So this is a, this is a sort of key area that we can feed into um, in terms of right to repair, also designing things for repairability so that they can last longer. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and so part, part of our um, website is about allowing people to sort of share their examples of personal repair experiences. So there's a great gallery to, to show um, um, anyone who's interested how people are going about actually repairing things either themselves or even maintaining them because maintenance is an important part of keeping things working longer um, so yeah so it's entirely voluntary and we would love it if more of you would be interested to to sign up and share your data on this because it's really important data for um future right to repair um next slide i think that's that's it and, that, and that's the website <laughs> bigrepairproject.org.uk Okay, thank you so much, Danielle and Mark, for that excellent uh, introduction. Some really exciting things going on there. We better move swiftly on to our next speaker, please. That's uh, Janetta Marenko from the University of Exeter. Over to you. Uh, that's super. Just to check, can you hear me well? Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you so much for the introductions. Um, at the core, um, I am a design engineer. And there was a point um, in my life when I stumbled upon uh, the world of psychology, human psychology. And so I combine uh, the two topics in my work in the secular economy. And what interests me the most um, in this space are people's behaviors um, in circular systems and how we can design their journeys uh, and the systems around them uh, to ensure that they can perform circular behaviors such as reuse, um, remanufacture or repair. Next slide, please. Um, and so um, a kind of key takeaway I want to talk about here today is that um, product design is important uh, when it concerns uh, repair, uh, but on its own, it's not enough to unlock and sustain repair um, as a consumption model. 
And um, the main point here is that businesses who provide us with repairable products uh, need to account for what repair journeys they take us through and whether systems conditions uh, that there are, um, you know, are enough for us to pursue repair, uh, you know, regardless of whether, whether products are repairable or not. Next slide, please. And, um, and repair um, is the behavior uh, that is perform, uh, performed part of an interdependent behavior chain. Uh, for example, as I said, for me to be able to repair my mobile phone, um, the phone needs to be designed for disassembly. Uh, and I need to either consciously or incidentally buy a repairable phone uh, at the beginning of my journey uh, to be able to uh, perform a repair uh, later on, say, 300 day, days down the line uh, when it breaks. So here we are showing an example of an attribute of a consumer journey, which um, are dependencies. Uh, and those occur throughout our journey. Next slide, please. And so another key thing to uh, consider when introducing repair into a system is defining it at a micro level uh, by breaking it down into individual sequenced actions to really understand what is um, that we are asking the consumer to do, um, to understand you know, how can we design their journey better. And next slide, please, please sorry. And so um, the question is, you know, why this is um, um, helpful? Well, every behavior um, in a chain um, is at risk of not being performed. And so looking broadly in more detail at individual behaviors um, and the conditions in which they are performed, we can really spot what hinders or uh, what motivates them. Um, and this um, can concern, you know, purchasing behavior at the beginning of, uh, of the repair journey, but also uh, the string of repair actions. Uh, so actually we are looking quite broadly as to what's happening throughout uh, people's journeys. Uh, so here we have a consumer um, intrinsic influences, such as psychological and physiological factors uh, that motivate our behavior. And so for example, what can hinder a consumer to pursue repair on their mobile phone um, kind of journey of repair uh, is the fact that for them to access an authorized repair shop requires them to travel far to get it repaired. Uh, or for example, um, their perception uh, that, you know, there, there is uh, only one day wait to get their phone repaired and they can retain all the data on it versus waiting 10 days for a new phone and losing all the data can motivate them to uh, pursuing a repair. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so, but now the, the, the kind of the repair story expands here. And so not only we are, you know, strongly influenced by, by the intri intrinsic factors, uh, but there is a array of systemic factors that lead consumers to perform repair. And so those um, are in the first instance and really important enablers, uh, such as the key infrastructure, products, or even people uh, that are crucial to, uh, to the repair journey and they matter at different point in time. And other factors are elements that instruct our behavior. So, you know, we need to uh, tell consumers what they are required to do at the right point in the chain to ensure that they are, you know, feeling, they feel empowered to perform repair, but also that they perform it correctly. And so those systemic factors can already be in existence, such as there may be an existing network of repair shops. Uh, and there are some systemic factors that businesses need to introduce in order to um, run the repair system. And so those are, for example, spare parts, uh, tools for repair and instruction manuals. And uh, not only that, uh, they need to make these different system elements relevant to the consumers at different points on their behavior chain. Next slide, uh, please. Thank you. And um, I think here, just to finally showcase a little bit more, um, repair systems overlap and compete with other systems. So uh, when consumers are on their journey, they stumble upon you know, variety of systemic conditions 
uh, that don't necessarily belong to the repair journey, such as, for example, uh, there are systems that encourage us uh, to, you know, recurrently purchase new phones with a contract. So, so we need to be able to introduce relevant nudges in the system uh, to to be able um, to maintain their journey. And so those can be incentives, um, uh, perceptive communication, and so on. And so to conclude, um, you know, we know repair is a systemic transformation, and that is really, you know, extremely complex. Um, but uh, it is not entirely impossible uh, if we account for the role of people in it and the staff that they need around them to to be able to buy into it. Um, and I think that consumer journeys and, uh, you know, the kind of behavior change perspective um, are really a starting point to designing, you know, this very synchronized and successful repair system. And just to go to the final slide, please, Emily, um, if it's useful to you, you can read more about what are the attributes of consumer circular journeys, such as repair, um, although here uh, we kind of described it in the context of reuse. Um, so this is useful, it's got a set of attributes um, and it shows how looking at uh, circular um, journeys can be useful in the design of circular systems. Um, thank you, I think that's it for me. That's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Janetta. That was absolutely fascinating. I think it highlights the sort of temporal nature of uh, this that we need to be mindful of. So I think our uh, I will pass over to our next speaker then, which is um, Stephen James, who is from Bayes and um, from a more sort of policy and legislative perspective. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, thanks for having me. Delighted to be here. Really interesting presentations uh, so far. Um, so just in, in terms of background, so I work in Office for Product Safety and Standards. We're part of Bayes um, and we're the national regulator for the majority of consumer products um, and also the enforcement authority for a number of goods and standards based regulations, uh, particularly in the environmental space. So, for example, eco design, which is the vehicle for um, right to repair. Um, but I'll mainly be talking from a product safety and liability perspective. Um, my background is as an engineer um, and I support the work of the office through technical support, commissioning research to develop evidence um, and also developing standards to improve minimum requirements and also set some aspirational ones. Um, and a key priority uh, within the office at the moment is to consider how we support the transition to net zero while maintaining safety. Uh, so we want to ensure that we achieve both the environmental outcomes and safety outcomes. It shouldn't be either or um, and try to avoid conflicts between our environmental and safety requirements um, because there are some potential challenges and risks as, as we move to net zero that need to be considered in terms of safety. Um, I think a prime and quite poignant example is um, with fridge freezer insulation um, which was added to uh, fridge freezers um, a uh, couple of decades ago to improve the energy efficiency of them, but that actually contributed to, by adding lo loads of foam insulation, contributed to the fire load, increased the fire hazard, um, and there's been some catastrophic fires as a result of that. Um, similarly with um, chemical risks of recycled materials, um, particularly with, with toys, um, and also around longe longevity of products. So if we're asking people to use um, products for longer, um, we need to ensure that they're being maintained and they're safe during their whole um, lifetime. And then finally, bringing it kind of back to repair, um, one key area for debate is around um, how safety is in, uh, checked and, and maintained for repaired pro um, products and, and something we're working quite closely with our government, um, in, uh, both uh, DEFRA and, and Bayes Eco Design um, colleagues. Um, in terms of what we're doing now, um, as we have left the EU, we have the ability to develop a new framework for product safety. Um, and to support this, we uh, recently had a call for evidence where we asked for views on the future product safety um, regime, including questions around um, environmental considerations. Um, I wanted to share a few of the key takeaways. We had about 158 responses um, across all stakeholders. Um, so many stakeholders stress the need for safety considerations to remain the top priority. Um, respondents across all groups were generally supportive of increasing product repairability 
um, but frequently ra raised concerns around uh, clarity of liability and how the safety um, of products could be checked and maintained. Um, many noted the conditions of the repair, such as the competency of the repairer, the parts used, um, the instructions followed, um, and how that could all affect the safety of the product. Um, manufacturers on one side were concerned about potentially being held liable for substandard repairs, for example, by third party or amateur repairers. Um, but at the same time, consumer groups um, emphasised that uh, suitable repairs should not invalidate um, product warranties or guarantees. Um, and there are mixed views in terms of how we might address this, and, and this is something we're thinking through at the moment, but things including allowing authorised professionals to repair products using um, approved parts, um, requiring manufacturers to provide guidance online, uh, requiring manufacturers to make manuals available, um, and uh, potentially the repairer becoming liable as well. And these were similar concerns raised around kind of refurbished, reconditioned, upcycled products um, and secondhand products as well. And I think there's certainly a question around risk here. So, um, for example, repairing a tumble dryer has different risks to repairing a low power consumer uh, electronics such as a laptop. Um, my experience, I've kept my MacBook from 2011 running to this date. It's quite modular. It's quite easy to repair. I haven't got a soldering iron out. Uh, there's definitely less risk involved there. Um, in, in terms of quick wins, the last thing I just wanted to mention um, is I think in standards have a very important role to play here. Um, so we know consumers are more conscious about environmental aspects, um, but they're very susceptible to things like greenwashing uh, if there's no standardized way of doing and measuring the environmental impact of the product. Um, the Royal Society of Chemistry did a survey uh, recently of 10,000 people and 60% said they would be more likely to switch to a rival if they knew the product was made in a sustainable way. And there are many similar studies in that space, so kind of heading in the same direction. Um, and we also understand that navigating our way towards uh, net zero can be challenging for some. And this is why we have recently commissioned uh, the British Standards Institute um, who are developing a new standard to support industries transition to net zero um, and empower consumers to make greener choices with safety being a core part of this too. Um, and so this will include environmental uh, life cycle assessments of products such as the resource efficiency, emissions, repairability is going to be um, a key part of that. Um, and so really interested to hear about the work uh, the repair project are doing definitely interested to talk, talk more about that and I will call for this kind of circular economy community to engage with this standard and please do get in touch um, if you're interested and um, so we'll leave it there as I know we're running a bit behind time but I'm um, happy for any questions. That's great thank you so much Stephen really really um, useful insights from from the sort of policy and, and particularly the standards uh, perspective that you've just brought in there so thank you very much for that. Um, so our final contribution before we go to questions is from Kyle Weens, um, founder of iFixit, who uh, is in the US and I think it's the middle of the night there. So he is going to be, there's going to be a video of his contribution. He's not uh, with us, but um, so hopefully we can uh, watch the video now. Hello, uh, I'm Kyle Weens. Very excited to be with you. Uh, I'm joining you from California, where it's a little bit earlier uh, in the day than it is uh, with all of you. Really excited to be joining this CE Hub discussion. I am uh, here in iFixit's lab. This is our this is our uh, investigation area where we we dive into all the latest technology, figure out what makes them tick. Uh, if you're not familiar with iFixit, we're the open free repair guide for everything. Our goal is to make it possible, make it easy, even for people to fix all their things, uh, whether it was designed uh, to be easy to fix or not. Uh, and in order to do that, we disassemble all the latest products, we take them apart, we figure out what makes them tick, what makes them break, and then how to reverse that. And that, that process uh, is a lot of fun. It involves you know, getting in and learning how all kinds of things in the world work. Uh, so showing you around our lab here a little bit, uh, we have all kinds of, of test equipment, video equipment, where we're figuring out how things work. Uh, right now we are in the process, this is a crazy repair fixture that I'll tell you about here in a minute. Uh, and, then, and then we have some of our 
some of our repair tools that we've designed and, and we're in the process of working on. This is an iPhone 13. Uh, so it's, it's uh, a, a delight to join you. I wanted to give you a quick update on what's happening in the world of repair, particularly right to repair. Right to repair is the idea that if you bought it, it you own it, you should be able to uh, do what you want with it. You should be able to fix it. And there shouldn't be uh, obstacles in the way. And those obstacles could be everything from uh, lack of repair parts to actual intentional software blocks uh, getting in the way of you fixing your things. Uh, since we started working on this, gosh, it, I fix it's been tilting at this particular windmill for close to 20 years. Uh, uh, we have found uh, all kinds of obstacles. We've been systematically knocking them down. The first obstacle that we found was a lack of, of availability of service information. And so we said, all right, well, if the manufacturers won't show their service information anymore, fine, we'll make our own. And so we started crowdsourcing. We've uh, bit, uh, posted thousands and thousands of repair manuals online over the years. I think we're up over 70,000 repair guides right now. We're the largest uh, single repair manual I think the world's ever seen, at least public repair manual. We're adding more all the time, but even, even as fast as we can write manuals, we can't keep up with the manufacturers. So that's where you have uh, right to repair legislation come in and the European Commission is looking at right to repair uh, uh, protection measures. You have the Australian government, the Productivity Commission looking at, at uh, repair options in Canada. Uh, the, the Liberal uh, government has uh, made right to repair part of their party platform. And then of course in the United States, you have President Biden backing right to repair and over 25 US states so far this year proposing right to repair laws. Uh, none of those laws have passed uh, except one that just made it over the finish line in Colorado. We have our first ever right to repair bill for electronics. This is for electronic uh, electric wheelchairs in the state of Colorado. Uh, it was fought tooth and nail by manufacturers that are monopolizing service revenue for fixing wheelchairs. And uh, it, was, um, it was overwhelmingly passed uh, uh, in both the House and the Senate and it will be signed by the governor any day now. Uh, so that's an exciting win, and we're, we're looking forward to building on momentum there. There's uh, momentum for federal legislation in Congress as well as in the states. So that, that's kind of on the right to repair front, that's like there's building a, a regulatory kind of floor for saying, hey, this is the absolute minimum that you have to do uh, to make a product uh, on the market. Okay, cool. But what, where, where does the innovation come from? Well, there's a lot of different uh, 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 attempts out there. Um, and making repairable products, some more successful than others. So I'm sitting here surrounded by, I told you about this crazy machine I was going to show you. So this is a, a repair fixture from Apple. Apple just announced that they have their new um, uh, consumer self-repair program. And that self-repair program involves buying $1,200 of tools. And these are pretty hefty fixtures. You can see this is a serious deal. This is both a heating and a suction cup fixture. Um, so the idea is you stick the phone in, it heats it, and then you can, uh, and then you can separate the. Uh, you, you can, you know, it'll, it'll unglue it. Um, it's a, it's a pretty expensive fixture. Twelve hundred dollars is probably Apple's cost. These things uh, are very heavy and bulky, and uh, that's a way of of doing a repair. I fix its approach has been uh, to use off the shelf, you know, commodity injection uh, molded parts to make to make tools, but they require a little bit more skill to to execute. So this is, you know, Apple's approach is totally bulletproof. Uh, maybe a monkey can do it <laughs> uh, with the tools and, and our approach is, is a little bit more, more commoditized. We'll, we'll see which way wins. Uh, iFix has launched a partnership with Samsung where we're going to be working with them to make uh, repair parts and tools available. It's going to be the same tools that we make available to consumers right now. Apple's got uh, their kind of ivory tower uh, solution with very large expensive fixtures. Uh, but I, I would be remiss if I if I said that quickly without without pointing out that it really is a fundamental design problem that we have these very commonly used products that are glued together uh, that have minimal uh, intent from the beginning to be designed to be repaired. What we'd much rather see is screws or other innovative technologies that made these things easier to work on. So if I could give all of you a challenge as we think about what does the future of, of circular design, what's the future of repairable design look like, Let's design it so you don't need a $1,200 fixture or a lot of uh, you know, very fine motor skills in order to be able to repair something. Let's, let's make it so easy to repair things that the default consumer action is to fix something when it breaks rather than buying a new one. It should be easier to fix the things that we have 
than to buy a new one. It should be cheaper to fix the things that we have than to buy something new. So that all of the selfish incentives that people have drive them toward the right thing for the planet, the right thing for society, which is once we've manufactured the product, let's get as much utility and as much life as we can out of it. Uh, there's a world of ways that we could embolden and encourage uh, a repairable world. And so I would encourage you to you know, look for and elevate uh, creative ways of accomplishing that. Uh, this is not a task that any one organization or any one group can do on its own. It's going to take all of us really acting as a community to create a, a, a circular, repairable world. Uh, and I'm confident all of you can do it. Look forward to being part of the discussion uh, throughout the rest of this event. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you for that, Kyle. Uh, and although Kyle is not with us to be able to answer questions directly, he has invited uh, anybody that would like to get in touch to do so either via Twitter, email or on his website. And so you see those there. And so please do uh, contact him if you have any questions or comments about his uh, contribution. But at this point, we now have uh, 20 minutes uh, to have some discussion and some Q&A with the panel members that are uh, still with us. Um, so I'd like at this point to invite uh, audience members to either raise their hand uh, on, on the, with the raise hand function or to uh, type their comments or questions into the chat. Um, we have one or two already coming through, but while people are uh, trying to uh, type their, their questions. Uh, um, I will just um, pose one that uh, has um, come through for Stephen. Uh, this is around 3D printing, actually, because we, we haven't heard about that very much in the uh, presentations that we've had yet, but this is something that's obviously hugely on the rise. I mean, is there a, does this present an opportunity to improve the efficiency of repairs and, and what might be some of the, the safety and liability challenges from your perspective? Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, we've done some research around 3D printing um, replacement parts. Actually, there's definitely trends in 3D printing, um, both in terms of manufacturers offering that and uh, consumers doing that. Benefits include uh, cost, time saving, uh, flexibility to print on demand. Um, and I think there are some real opportunities for, for the circular economy here, not just um, with repairing, such as kind of distributed manufacturing and things like that. Um, and so we did some uh, research a couple of years ago, um, published on gov.uk, looking at the kind of safety and legal issues around um, 3D printing spare parts for appliances. Um, and there were two kind of key points. Um, so one was um, around um, the importance of parts being produced by reputable and qualified manufacturers um, and um, some uh, stakeholders uh, uh, kind of a noted in a uh, heightened risk profile around unauthorized uh, spare parts um, because things like the AM method that you use, the materials, equipment, part design, processing can all influence the quality and, and there's kind of limited standards in that space at the moment. Um, and the second part was around um, there's a kind of lack of uh, clarity in the law around uh, liability of those supplying 3D printed parts. Um, and this is because it's kind of more complex than traditional um, supply chains. And there was a case study that illustrated this quite well, um, which was essentially this uh, a real life example of a person who had a component on their bread maker, um, which uh, held the heating element in place. Um, it broke. There wasn't a spare part available um, from the manufacturer. So they designed a replaceable part um, to be 3D printed selected the materials based on their kind of rough calculations, estimations, um, printed it, fitted it to their um, bread maker. It seemed to work fine, but they then uploaded that design to the internet alongside a YouTube tutorial um, for others to use, um, which is great. And we want to kind of promote that. But if there were some um, safety issues, it's unclear whether the liability would fall on, for example, the person who designed the file, the person who printed the part, the manufacturer of the 3D printer, um, or the materials of the original equipment um, manufacturer. So there's a lot to kind of think through in this space, which we're kind of currently doing in, in our, our product safety review. Great. Thanks for that, Stephen. Um, anybody else on the panel want to comment on 3D printing? Otherwise, I can go to another question. I mean, I just just like to say, I think it's a really important part of the future. 
I mean, if when you look at trying to support um, things in our lives, boilers, you know, cars, laptops, um, so that they last 20, 10 or 20 years, at the moment, those companies are required by law to have some spare parts for a certain length of time, so often up to 10 years in the automotive industry. And that these are warehouses full of spare parts, which are then having to be maintained. So in terms of the CO2 emissions, for just that existing. A lot of those, when we talk to the, to the washing machine manufacturers and so on, it's, this is a big cost for them, but they have to do it uh, to support those models. Um, and there must be a better way. And, and 3D printing surely for some of those parts surely has to be a way to reduce that legacy of warehouses across the world with loads of parts, which are never gonna be used. They get, end up being scrapped a lot of them because the models change and people don't require them. And the manufacturers say it's all all loss making anyway. So it's I think you know from from a science and engineering point of view, and from an manufacturing point, of view, we really need to move in this direction. Great, thanks for that, Mark. Um, so we're, we're getting some more questions coming through, which is terrific. So please do keep keep them coming. I want to kind of combine a couple because actually. Um, Quite early on, Bob Barnes from the Environment Agency asked, oh, sorry, no, wrong one. Uh, Joss Whipple, I don't know if uh, he's still here, but he was asking around whether there are any examples. Uh, I think a lot of the examples covered have been from um, of electronics um, and sort of appliances and things. And the question was there also, are there any good examples of this happening uh, in relation to textiles? And um, there is also a question from Mark Hester from the uh, Imagination Factory uh, of are there what are the good examples of products uh, being designed already for repairability so can you highlight good examples so yeah just sort of are there any examples and within that how about sort of textiles and thinking about sort of fashion and stuff like that so anybody want to come in on those well we, we can I mean the good examples are there's a British company called Julet that have been making repairable toasters and and other products for a long time if you look on eBay you can buy old Julet toasters they still retain their value because the parts still exist <laughs> and that it's it is an issue here which they've done a very clever thing they've frozen the innovation of the toaster like toasting bread they've kind of aced it right and then they go we're just going to maintain that product with those parts and so they have a long life um, and I think that's a really great example. Another good example is another British company, Angle Poise, who give a lifetime guarantee on their lights and, and are saying they will supply parts for the whole lifetime. So there are really good examples. Um, and then in mobile phones, there's Fairphone, which is a, a modular phone designed to be repaired. Again, you can buy one and put one here. So you can take the back off, you can change the battery within 10 seconds. You can change the camera, you can change, I mean, it can be done. I know this is a bit bulkier than an iPhone, but you don't, I don't need a huge, uh, what, what was it that Carl was saying? This is a $1,200 piece of equipment. I don't need it because it's been designed to be repaired. Great. Thanks for those examples. Anyone else? Stephen, were you going to come in? It's not a specific example, but I think what the Fairphone does quite well, actually, is it's not just repairable, but it's upgradable. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what you're speaking to about that innovation in circular economy and sustainability um you don't just want to people don't want to have the same tech for ages um they want the new technology so if you can upgrade things um uh, that definitely makes it more appealing i think Junetta, anything to add or no, for me it's just a thought you know the question is about um whether there are uh, good examples of products designed for reper reparability but I wonder whether we could um, touch on the system. So, you know, not just products, but is there a scheme behind fair, you know, fair phone? Well, we know that, you know, it's modular, so we can replace components. But um, if we think broadly, um, maybe it's back to, to the panel, you know, how, what are the systemic uh, factors that together with the product work the best together to enable repair? Do you have examples? I could probably add add to the Jewelet example. So um, I've I've recently become an owner of a Jewelet toaster, um, and one of the one of the things that really stuck stuck um, and kind of stood out in that process was they they have kind of um, like a close comms like a communication system. So it's like an aftercare email service with a customer number and a registration, so that you register register your 
product with them. So there's, there's a kind of infrastructure with their toaster product service, which um, I think on, on a kind of basic level, it gives me confidence that I'm speaking to the manufacturer. So I, I feel like I have a direct line of communication with them. And there's also another reason for that. So if they have any safety issues, they have a direct line of communication with you. So they can say there's any problems with any kind of parts or issues along the supply chain. So that, that sort of, I suppose it's kind of an example of that, that sub, subset of infrastructure, which actually supports that product circularity or repairability. Great, thank you. Lots of discussion about duolits and, and also uh, Henry Hoovers and things in the chat there. So, so please do keep the good examples uh, coming if you, if you know of good examples of products or companies doing well in this space. Um, I wanted to turn to a slightly different question. Um, okay, so I don't know if she's still here anymore, but Nadia Marquez um, asked a question around, plan and actually this links to some other comments around planned obsolescence being a, a, a barrier. I mean, you touched on this in your talk, uh, Mark, at the beginning, that this is kind of, this, this is the, the, the fundamental business model that, that we kind of have that to make sort of products that don't last very long to, uh, uh, to sort of allegedly spur innovation and kind of keep um, the money rolling in. So she's su suggested that that has been uh, a, a barrier to um, repair shops and the like uh, continuing to exist in Portugal. Um, what she's asking about kind of experience from the UK, but perhaps also if you know good practice elsewhere around kind of how to incentivize stakeholders to engage more in sort of repair and, and move away from this kind of planned obsolescence model. Any takers, Mark? Well, it is. I mean, that is the fundamental question of all of this, isn't it? And um, so it's a good question. And, and, a comp and there's no, I guess, yeah, we can all add bits of, of what we know. I mean, um, I wouldn't say planned obsolescence um, in itself is, is the thing that stops repair. It, it's, it's unrepairable. Uh, obsolescent products so so when you look at um other countries uh, so lower and middle income countries where we work in a place like kenya what you find is a very healthy repair culture and it's because um well because a the cost of new is much higher compared to the to the medium income and and the cost of repair is lower in it because it's repair is a very um a labor intensive process generally want to get the parts and, and require skills and in the in the UK and probably in Portugal the reason why our repair shops dwindled is because the cost of a repair of a toaster or kettle was more than the actual new item whereas that's not true in other countries so uh, that that's a general thing where mass production um, and, and mass production to the point where it's um, the cost has come down so much that it's basically undermined all repair and, and, and what we're doing there, well, I say we, I mean, we're all part of this, aren't we? Because we buy those products, and we, but the manufacturers make them because they want. But it, what we're doing there is we're externalizing the cost to the environment. So it's a cheaper product, but, but because it's not repairable, because it doesn't get repaired, it ends up being very wasteful and huge CO2 emissions. So, so we have to move to the system uh, where, where repair is, um, where, where the environmental costs of not repairing something are part of the cost of a new item. And I think that's, in a way, you can think of it as a carbon tax or some other tax, which is just not part of the, of the, of the model at the moment. So for me, it's, there's a fundamental economic piece of the puzzle here to do with labor, cost of labor, that is, that is basically putting the repair shops out of business. And just to add to that as well, I think potentially two kind of vehicles for this. So you've got the kind of regulatory side, which we're seeing with the right to repair regulations, which are hopefully driving um, businesses, manufacturers to make their products more repairable, but also there's consumer demand for more repairable goods. Um, and so it's about kind of enabling and empowering, empowering those consumers to make purchasing decisions based on um, how environmentally friendly or how repairable um, something is, which is what we're trying to look to do in the in the standard space is to um, well standardize that essentially. A very quick follow up on that, Stephen, because somebody did ask about the standard, the BSI standard that you mentioned in your talk. Can you give us the name of that? Is that available? Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I did respond in the chat. It doesn't have a, a kind of code or, or name yet, but if people are interested, then please do get in touch okay. um, because it would be good to engage with the circular economy community on it. Great. Um, the, I think what we, we started to talk about here is, is some really interesting kind of almost psychological questions really about ownership. And I think this relates to some of the things that Jeanetta talked about. Um, but, but somebody's asked in chat, Phil, Phil has asked in the chat about kind of, this is all really about ownership models. Do we, why do we feel we need to own things when it's really, we just need the service that they provide? But is there something about kind of, um, the novelty of buying something, the feeling that it is yours to own. I liked um, Mark's idea about kind of moving from being consumers to guardians, but is that a psychological challenge for a lot of people? Do, do you think that actually the idea that maybe we don't own it, it's just sort of something we're looking after, but but some people maybe do feel attached to things. And so, so I just wonder about the sort of psychological shift that we might be asking, or if it's a cultural shift, I'm not sure. Do, what, what do you think about that? I don't know if Jeanetta wanted to start off or... <laughs> um, if I can go, uh, so there, uh, so I think there are, there's a distinction between uh, personal goods and the kind of emotional durability or emotional attachment. Uh, so personal electronics like mobile phones, you know, we deal with differently than we deal with uh, potentially, you know, uh, sofa or fridge. Um, so there is that, there are also norms. Uh, and so, uh, you know, our normative beliefs of what's acceptable, what we're allowed to do, uh, definitely play a role in our intention to buy products differently. So, you know, for us, maybe that work in the second economy space, we're more aware, uh, you know, of the journeys our products go through. So we, we are more inclined to buy more sustainable products, but not everyone is. And I think it's about, uh, you know, in a system already, you know, at the beginning, before they even embark on the repair journey, you know, how do we, you know, hit them with the right information, information, and you know, and and kind of tackle what matters to them. So there are norms. There is a you know a set of perceptions towards uh, the kind of uh, rental model. Uh, so in there, we become more stewards rather than owners as we guide the you know. A mobile phone through the system. I don't know. It's a very loaded uh, discussion. I could talk about it forever. I think, but I think the, the the key thing is, you know, we need to account for what are the kind of psychological factors that influence our buying decisions. And um, I feel like in circular models, you know, altogether there is something for everyone there. You know, we can uh, own and return, or we can share. You know, Janetta, I'm wondering if um, we, we've been thinking about this here, which is about trust. So. It comes up a lot with the software updates that if you if you if you're if if a company can cut a software update so steven's laptop is now is now called a legacy laptop and it isn't being updated by apple anymore after 10 years that's perhaps reasonable but after three years i mean what should be a reasonable amount what if your what if your toaster or washing machine in the future doesn't get updated so there's a trust issue here with ownership which is hinging around you're trusting the company to keep supporting you um and I think with, and then the other way around goes that the company has to trust you. So when you have a, a rental model, um, uh, the companies we talk to in terms of the personal householding, they, they say there's not much take up because people don't want to feel a company could take away your washing machine. If they, if you're renting it from them, they can take it back and they don't want to feel that. So it, it's actually, as you say, really complicated about um, trust and personal responsibility and company responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just to add to that as well. I think there are a few models where we do um, it's kind of more servitization based, like um, phones and cars. So um, I do, and Ellen MacArthur did a great think piece around um, servitization of uh, washing machines um, in one of their reports, and the idea that you have, um, you know, a more durable washing machine, which is going to cost more to make because you have to buy more expensive parts in but then it can go through its life cycle at different kind of price points um and so um when it's 15 years old it is then a cheaper model but it is still better made than a cheap um model that won't last as long if that made sense mm -hmm. yeah um yeah thank you for that i mean i think there's a few um there's a sort of few other barriers um, also being mentioned in the chat. So around, for example, review websites like which 
that don't necessarily include durability or repairability in how they kind of evaluate products. They're mostly just looking at sort of the, the, the basic, the, how well it performs or maybe cost. Um, and there was also uh, the issue around kind of the space to uh, the cost of renting space for a repair shop might be prohibitive in, in some cases. Is that anything? Are these some of the, the, the issues that you're finding, Stephen, in, in the work that you're doing? Is, is it something that might be factored into um, in, into your work? Um, sorry, was that around cost? Uh, it, the cost of renting a space for like to have a repair shop, like I guess on the high street or whatever, like they can be very expensive to actually have a, a space to rent. Um, and then review websites, for example, are you working with the likes of which to kind of think about how to highlight durability as part of what they, uh, if, how they evaluate products? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. We're, we're hoping to bring them into the, um, in, into the standard that um, we're, we're developing and yeah, getting that. I think part of the issue with, um, you know, um, durability and things like that at the moment is there's no way or kind of standardized way to actually assess that. So it can be difficult. Um, so that might be why they're not doing it. And so it's about kind of trying to provide the tools to enable them to, to do that. Okay, great. I'm really conscious of time and there's some, there are a few other things in the chat that I didn't get a chance to uh, read out. Oh, and I would have loved to talk about Rumbelows, uh, uh, three back to the 80s there, um, but uh, we are virtually out of time. So I'm really sorry to um, call a close to things, but thank you so much to our fantastic panel. I've learned loads and thank you very much indeed for all the comments and questions. Um, uh, it's been a really interesting hour. Thank you for attending. Um, the CE Hub would be very grateful if um, attendees could spare a minute or two to fill in a short feedback form. I think the link will be uh, posted imminently. Uh, the recording from today will be made available on the CE Hub website within the next couple of weeks. That's hosted on their new Knowledge Hub, which has lots of different resources relating to circular economy. So do have a look around. And the next webinar in this series is at midday on Thursday, the 23rd of June, and that will be on the relationship between uh, circular economy and net zero. So lots, I think, to follow up there from what we've heard today. But thank you again to the wonderful speakers and audience for um, participating too. And have a great day, everybody.